Thank you. Um, and I think the last thing is I just uh, encourage you to, to halt any effort to uh, develop a central bank digital currency. It doesn't need designed, developed, and it certainly doesn't need established. I yield. A small business is the backbone. It's the, the, and, the and bloodline they, of our They economy. create the jobs. That's yes. right. I, I do agree. Yeah. Okay. Come back despite all that. Um, looking at the monetary policy report, March 1st, 2024. And as I review this, I would like to focus on the term that I would say high prices are here to stay. Because what I've heard you say today in this report really go to is you got everything under control, but it's, we're going to keep the high prices. And I think the high prices really take a toll on the American people, as you're hearing from our colleagues, no matter whether they be Republican or Democrat. This year, total credit card debt reached a record of $1.7 trillion. According to Intuit Small Business Annual in Index Annual Report, average monthly credit card balances were 27% higher in 2023 than they were in 2019. What do you view as the driving force behind these record high levels of credit card debt? Part of it would be growth in the economy. So that'll be part of it, just that it's a bigger economy and a, and a bigger number. I don't, I don't, I'm not sure, I'm not sure what that is. You know, as you know, people had lots of extra cash uh, during the pandemic from forced savings. They have spent that down. Now they're borrowing. Um, I'm not sure. Do you agree uh, with the April Federal Reserve report that compensation incentives contributed to Silicon Valley's bank failure? I'm sorry, did, did I, I? So the April Federal Reserve report. It said that compensation incentives contributed to the Silicon Valley Bank's failure. Do you agree with that? I would say it's at best a tertiary factor, but it probably had something to do with it. For me, not a major. So that's no? That's very small. Okay, so it did. Okay. So do you agree the appropriate rules on incentive compensation could have reduced the likelihood of Silicon Valley's failure? Maybe. You know, if they didn't take no, all that money. I really money. don't think so. I mean, if I, they I didn't don't take think all that a, money. I, I don't think it's a first order question for Silicon Valley. A lot went wrong there. Yeah. Incentive comp would They be actually blame you guys. The they Sorry. blame, they blame, they blame the oversight, even though they didn't respond to your That's correspondences. We, we took our medicine. Yeah. Do you think it also has something to do with the fact that Section 956 of the Dodd Frank rule hasn't been finalized by you? No, I don't. You don't think it's the reason? I don't. You don't think it's because people made money off of the failure? I think nothing. You don't think money drove them to do what they did? I didn't say that. I did. What I said, you know, there, there are lots so of... So they made money from it. They, they actually, it was I a lottery for them, right? that incentive compensation arrangements were at the heart of the Silicon Valley Bank failure. No. Okay. Do you support a robust rulemaking for executive compensation, Chairman? I, I know that the... I know that the... Oh, you don't? I'm sorry? Oh, I'm, this is, do you support robust rulemaking for executive compensation? Do you, do you believe in Section 956? Section 956 is the law. As I understand it, the agencies are looking at doing something. It, it's been 12 or 13 years, right? Yeah, and multiple agencies. Has happened. Yeah. It's been hard to get it done. I lived through the last episodes of trying yeah. to get it done. So, so do you believe in a robust I, I rulemaking believe, process for executive compensation? I do. I do, yeah. Oh, great. Oh, that's awesome. Um, will you com will, will you commit to helping finalize the Dodd Frank section of nine five six this year? I I, I would. It's been twelve that. years, Chairman. Yeah, no, I want. It played I a role say, in the bank I, failure, Chairman. If I can answer, I, what I would like to do is. So you don't want to do it this year? I mean, I'm being serious. What, you, what you're saying? No. If the member will Let allow answer. the witness to answer the question. We've had a good day today, and the gentleman's trying to answer the question. I would like to understand the problem we're solving, and then I would like to see a, a proposal that addresses that problem. Okay. Do you believe people should profit off of bank failure, the executives that made those decisions? No. not, not, not They the should not profit. Well, I, I would say executives who are responsible for a failed bank should, should not profit from the failure. Absolutely not. So they get to walk away with compensation based on their failure. Well, you're asking, true. You're asking about a, 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 a different rule that would do you have clawback and things like that? But yeah. Yeah, so that, that's that's something I know you've been looking at for, for a while. 
Yeah. That's that's certainly an appropriate thing to look at. Yeah, because it's just going to continue to happen, is my opinion. It doesn't have to be yours, but it sure sure the heck could have helped here if they knew they were going to not they were going to walk away if they could walk away with not the bonuses, the compensation. I mean, they made money, a significant amount of money for their bank failure. Welcome, Welcome to, to the, the crypto, crypto teacher. teacher. And you know I come back with that video just to make you think. Don't forget to like and subscribe to the channel. And make sure you're joining the Patreons. If you're not a part of the Patreons, make sure you're in the Cash App. And those who are part of my Patreon and those who had the NWO book, we see AGIX pumping and then also... The NWO Crypto's pumping. Some of you listen, some of you don't. I'm not your financial advice, not financial advice. Please do your own research. But guys, we had Jerome in the house. And we have Davidson says no CBDC. But we know all about Enbridge. And it doesn't matter whether you call it a CBDC or a stable coin. It's all programmable. To be able to tell you what, when, when, how to buy and you have three to six months to spend it or poof, it's gone. And we have Jerome Powell admit small businesses are the backbone. They create the jobs. And guess what? If these small banks go out of business, small businesses will go out of business. And that means plenty of layoffs. We already see the big corporations laying off left and right. And high prices are here to stay. But we already heard that from Janet Yellen. She admitted these prices are not coming down. Not just yet, guys. They have to destroy this legacy market. And we have a total of $1.7 trillion in credit card debt. And Jerome Powell seems like he doesn't know where it comes from. We know where it's coming from. It's coming from inflation. And we had Jerome Powell, the only person that backed him in a corner, asked about compensation to these executives while these businesses are failing. Same way we saw in 2008, the CEOs getting paid big money while the companies crumble. And we know there's a volcano about to erupt with this commercial real estate. And it's going to destroy these small and medium-sized banks. And now we're seeing the players come in. Citadel, Steve Mnuchin. So we know we have to keep an eye on him. And we know Steve Mnuchin and we have to look around the corner for George Soros. And then, guys, we have Jerome Powell speaking about the power of AI, these deep fakes, the one on YouTube with Larry Fink. It would definitely get you if you didn't know the person and their mannerisms. And the same way these bots are allowed to take over social media, the same way we're starting to see deep fakes take over social media, and they're allowed to. So that means it's part of a plan, guys. It's something big around the corner. And we know what that is. WW3. Remember, guys, it's not going to be physical this time. It's going to be cyber. And then someone finally brings it up. We have the underground economy, and that's exactly what we have. Because where I'm at, guys, these restaurants are allowing illegals to work. They can't speak any English and you can clearly tell they're just told to stay out the way. And again, guys, we know the strategy. We know the plan. If you're a part of my patrons, you know I've done several videos on it. And then we have Basel 3. And of course, everybody's going to be against it. But remember, guys, this is a global agenda. Always remember, two steps forward, one step back. The United States might not begin with it. But it's going to end up with it. And remember the crypto teacher told you. And then Jerome Powell was asked, is the United States going to go into a recession? Guys, we're already in a recession. The question is, are they going to admit we're in a great depression? And we have Maxine Waters pushing the affordable housing agenda. Remember what I told you guys. These average people that bought these three, four, and $500,000 homes, they're going to be underwater. Over these next five years, housing prices are going to plummet. Remember, 3D printed homes are going to be the future. And then, guys, we have Jerome Powell admitting he's not ready to cut rates. And what's that's going to happen to stocks and cryptos? That's right. They're going to be taking a beating, but it's going to be a slow grind down while yield rates do a slow grind up. 
And we know that crisis is around the corner. Because remember, you can do things that you normally would not have been able to do. And we know that's landing us in the fourth industrial revolution. Where the robots, algorithms, and drones take the economy over, pay each other with crypto, and the sheep go inside the metaverse. And remember the crypto teacher told you. Because he knows. When it comes to the NWO, it's all planned out. You have a wonderful day. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Welcome. Good to see you again. I want to go a little deeper into the commercial real estate issue and the potential impact on regional banks. Uh, this morning, uh, Scott Rector, who's a, a member of the New York Fed Board of Directors, released a white paper on CNBC this morning. Uh, describing the trillions of dollars in commercial real estate loans that will come due over the next couple of years. He described it as a, quote, slow-moving train wreck, close quote, and uh, for, for our regional banks. Uh, he went on to predict that it will force between a little over 500 banks, thereabouts, to either fail or consolidate. Um, he also described what he termed as a doom loop where, you know, similar to Silicon Valley Bank, when people lose confidence, when depositors lose confidence in, in the bank, they, they pull their money out and we end up in a bad situation. Uh, now, <clears throat> you know, I don't believe everything that, that, that I, I read or hear, but in Congress we do tend to repeat it. And uh, I just wanted to get a sense from you. I am seeing in my own city of Boston we've got 20% vacancy rates in, in office space. We rely on that for a lot of the tax revenues for the city. Uh, but I'm just wondering your thoughts on that issue. Is there a systemic concern here uh, or is this isolated and, uh, you know, might, might lowering the interest rates help some of those banks? Because I hear from my developers in, in our area that no one's lending. So, yeah, crack at it. Sure. So I, I haven't seen that report, so I can't comment on it, but, but I can comment on, on a commercial real estate. So. We've had a secular change in the economy, which has left office, you know, office uh, rentals in many places, office buildings. Demand for them is just is significantly lower, at least temporarily and perhaps for a long time. And also the same is true for downtown, in some places, downtown retail that's associated with office workers. So it's a shock to the system. And we know we've known this for some time and we've gone through the commercial banks in the United States and, and so have the other regulators who've done it jointly and identified the ones that have high concentration and are going to need to deal with that. And so we've been, we've been in contact with those banks and, you know, uh, talking to them about how they're going to deal with this, how are they going to absorb these losses, do they have enough capital, do they have the liquidity, do they have a plan to do this, and are, is it consistent with their lending practices and that kind of thing. So it's going to be something we work through over a period of years. Uh, and um, I, I do think it's it's slow moving. I think that part of it is right. Uh, it, it, you ask about 500 banks, I have no idea about that number. I, you know, But certainly there would be some banks, probably smaller ones, uh, that have these high concentrations. It, it's not the very large banks. It's really a manageable thing at the large banks. So uh, I think that's what it's going to be. And it's, it's a serious problem. and, and um, and more serious in some locations and jurisdictions and with some banks than others. But it's one we'll, we'll be working through, and yeah. I, I think that's how I would think about it. In those, in those cases, it was instantaneous now. The, 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 the velocity of, of, of money moving out of those banks really, I think, in some ways contributed to, to their failures. Um, are, we, are we looking at any, anything technologically that, that might be able to address some of that or mitigate it? Sure. So, we, we, you know, we, we also, after Silicon Valley Bank, we, we got in contact with and worked with financial institutions that had high concentrations of uninsured deposits. And so, and many of them have, have greatly improved their, their liquidity position. So that's the thing that we're working on. As you probably know, we're also working on some, uh, some uh, liquidity rules, which will strengthen our, our, our framework of liquidity rules. But that's, yeah. that's something we haven't proposed yet. And it, it's the practice of paying interest on excess reserve balances held at the held with the Fed accounts. It's my strong belief that rewarding banks with returns for taking no market risk actually harms our economy, and it discourages financial institutions from lending money into the economy. Instead, they park it at the Fed. 
Now, this has uh, little to no impact on very large corporations, but it can have a crippling impact on small and mid-market firms. And we especially saw this uh, in, the, in the long recovery uh, as Dodd-Frank was implemented uh, in the Obama years, uh, transition to the Trump years. We changed some of that mindset with a lot of other policies, uh, but we saw a, a, a strong surging economy. So our, our country wouldn't pay a price for this market distortion by the Fed in two ways. First, they're unable to obtain loans at competitive rates uh, because the money sucked out of the market. Uh, frankly, a lot of them don't even have access to lending except through bank capital. So it forces them into other forms of capital, equity capital and others. Uh, second, uh, th they ultimately pay higher rates whenever they have these alternative uh, means of capital. And uh, so today I've introduced a prohibition on the uh, IOER Act, which would prohibit the Federal Reserve from paying interest on excess reserves. By eliminating IOER, we can begin to return our economy to the undistorted free market economy it's supposed to have. The alternative is you could simply raise requirements. We, we see some of those moral hazards when you do it across the board uh, to uh, with approach like Basel. So what's your case for why you should keep paying interest on excess reserves? Well, we, as you know, we don't see the, uh, the downsides that you're talking about. You know, banks, banks have a cost of funds and they have what they can earn. And that's what really matters is the spread. And if they wanted to do it, they could simply buy treasuries on their own uh, and, and they could do that independently. Uh, I suppose they can independently keep it at the Fed. But they don't have to buy. They don't even have to put it on their own balance sheets in the same way. They've got immediate liquidity with the Fed over it, over overnight account. So I don't I don't see how that's different than what they could already do. What I was going to say was, you know, banks banks can earn a much bigger spread by lending to corporates. So their their incentive to lend is the same as it always was. This doesn't affect that. You know, really, it's their they have a cost of funds and they have the ability to earn, to, have, to have reserves. But you know that that's not going to they're not earning a profit on that. So, or, or a big one, they can run a much bigger profit by lending to small corporations. Well, speaking of profit, I mean, the Federal Reserve isn't officially supposed to be a for-profit corporation, but you are supposed to pay uh, for your operating costs off of positive cash flow. And right now, the Fed doesn't have positive cash flow. In fact, the Fed has negative cash flow. Um, so it's not entirely unrelated that uh, the Federal Reserve operated a $114.3 billion loss in 2023 and currently is carrying a $133 billion loss on its balance sheet this year. So it, it, it's, you know, not the right approach, I think, to be paying essentially that much out in excess reserves to, to banks that uh, are holding capital uh, in the Fed when they could be deploying it into the market. So right now, the interest you're paying banks and money market funds exceeds the income you're getting uh, on the $7.6 trillion balance sheet assets that you have to the tune of $133 billion uh, asset. So, you know, effectively, the Fed is operating at, a, at an operating loss. So what's the path back to cash flow positivity for the Fed? As, as you know, we, you know, for many years uh, during the QE large balance sheet period, we've contributed way over a trillion dollars in net earnings to the bank, which is to, to the Treasury Department. So you can't, you can't look at the loss without mentioning that we've been you know, giving effectively a hundred billion dollars a year in profits every year to the Treasury Department. So the other side of that is when we raise rates to do the job you've assigned us to get inflation under control. Uh, when we do that, we, we we absorb paper losses. It has no effect on our operating uh, the way we operate the Fed. And you know, if we, if we retained all the earnings we have, then it wouldn't be a problem. But we don't do that. We give that money to Treasury. You know, one of the things I, yesterday I had two two different uh, foreign banker CEOs in my office, and they they brought it. One of them brought up the subject to me, which is very concerning with regards to artificial intelligence uh, being able to impact financial institutions in this country and our and our banking system. And I tell people, I said, you know, think about this for for a second. You know, you find some individual who is a well known individual, perhaps Larry Kudlow, Dave Ramsey, uh, Bloomberg, somebody who has got credibility, and suddenly you see an artificially produced advertisement or Facebook post, and this person says, look here, we've got 100 banks that have got a problem today. Now, that individual didn't do this. It's artificially produced. I've seen a commercial already with the individual. You couldn't tell the difference between that individual and, 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 and the real thing. We have just come through the Silicon Valley situation. And if you have real-time payments, Fed now, where you can instantaneously transfer money, and you have people scared to death by some well-known individual 
through an artificial intelligence situation. And I can tell you that China is watching this like a hawk. They are ready to pounce on this situation. To me, I've got some bills that actually would solve the problem. Do you think there's some there's some issues here we need to be taking a look at? Yeah, I, I think we're we're very focused on um, AI. Like I mean, many government agencies and and law enforcement agencies in particular, it's it's very challenging. You 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 paint one picture. There are lots of pictures. Gentlemen's time has expired. It's interesting now. The, four, the foreign Gentleman's banks are actually expired. watching this. I would say yes to that. I think um, I think it is manageable, and we've been you know working hard to management for some time now, really. Um, and, you know, what it really is, is it's a lot of downtown real estate where, where, where there's too much office supply because of work from home, work from home, and also, you know, the kind of downtown uh, retail that it's no longer as profitable. And things like that are really at the heart of it. Um, so what we've done is we've, um, we've looked at banks that have significant concentrations. And we've been in touch with them to make sure that they have a plan to deal with that. Uh, there will be losses by some banks. It isn't really the big banks. It's really medium and small sized banks that have these higher concentrations. Um, it's going to be with us. This is a problem we'll be working through, I think, for several years. And uh, the idea is you've got to have enough capital, enough liquidity, and a plan to you know take the losses that you're probably going to take. And uh, and so that's what we're doing. We're we're very active in in this space with small, medium. So, so let me ask banks. you about that. Sorry to interrupt, but let me ask you about that Silicon Valley Bank. <clears throat> wild irresponsibility inside the bank, egregious irresponsibility on the part of corporate treasurers who put so much on deposit. The Fed also had some self-examination to do because the examiners and the supervisors of the bank, quite frankly, were not doing what they should have been. So we might be forgiven for being a bit skeptical of claims of being on this. What what has changed in the uh, context of Silicon Valley Bank that gives you the confidence that supervisors and the examiners will be on top of this? I, I see it with my own eyes, but but you know, I mean, frankly, there, there's there's a risk that we would overreact to something as de as as significant as that. It's it's not like we wouldn't have reacted very very strongly to what happened in, with Silicon Valley Bank, and we have. Uh, so I, I know that our our supervisors are out there, and we're you know we're hearing back from uh, from from uh, you know media reports that we have been engaged with medium and small sized banks principally on this. So I, I am confident that we're doing. The right things there, uh, and I and I do believe it's a manageable problem. If that changes, you know, then I'll, I'll you know I'll say so. Thank you. I've, I've got to make a comment here. I just it's it's stunning to me that uh, equating an underground economy, which is very different uh, than and not a healthy alternative uh, to the regular economy, uh, and basing that on an illegal workforce that's not legally able to work ultimately will fail. That, that is not a strategy to my colleagues on the other side. So um, just ask any farmer who's going to then have somebody, a regulator, come in and fine them for employing people who are not legally allowed to be here in the country. That is one of their greatest fears. So that's, that's just a fallacy of, of growth within this economy that is not sustainable. Thank you. And uh, Mr. Chairman, did you see that report? I did. Uh, does that concern you, that 97% of the comments uh, uh, were, were negative? So we didn't do our own counts, so I can't, I mean, I can't make an assessment, but I, I, it's, I would say it's unlike anything I've seen. Uh, Basel III, the Basel III comment period ended on the same day as the Fed's data collection on the proposal, which is an odd process since the data should have been collected far earlier, analyzed, and the results should have been available for the public to comment on before the comment period ended. Why did the Federal Reserve choose to do a quantitative impact study during the comment period uh, for the proposal, foreclosing any ability by the public to comment on the results of the study? Well, I mean, we are the movie's not over. We are where we are. And uh, Vice Chair Barr did commit to putting the QIS out for comment. We will receive those comments, and they'll be, they'll, the, those comments will be taken into consideration as we, as we think about the path ahead of last year very quickly. Um, do you think that the banks that ultimately needed uh, the government bailout lacked sufficient capital, or was it more of a management problem? So with Silicon Valley Bank, it wasn't, it wasn't really a, could they have used more capital? I mean, they were actually raising capital. It was a capital raise that they announced that triggered the run and everything. So you can argue that it needed more capital, but I wouldn't say that that was the proximate cause, really. It was it was a, a funding structure that was all about uh, too too much 
concentration of uh, yeah of uh, well, many many of us are. I'm asking the question because many of us are very concerned that uh, those failures are being used as an excuse to raise capital standards across the board. Um, are you now at a point where you believe that there will not be a recession? Uh, there was much talk about recession, and many people worried that we would find ourselves having to negotiate our way out of a recession. What is your position currently on a recession? So, um, U.S. growth last year was in excess of 3%. What we're seeing so far this year is continued solid growth. My expectation and that of other forecasters and of my colleagues is that we'll see continued growth at a solid pace. I will say so there's, there's no evidence or no reason to think that the U.S. economy is in or in some kind of short-term risk of falling into recession. Having said that, though, there's always a, a you know a, prob a possibility, a meaningful possibility that that an economy will fall into recession. I don't think that that, that possibility though is elevated at the current time. Thank you. I, I appreciate your saying this because we want to, at some point, eliminate a great deal of fear associated with the, just the term recession. In in the terms I just dis discussed, which is we want to keep the economy growing. We want the labor market to remain strong. 3.7% uh, unemployment is pretty near 50-year historical lows. We want inflation to continue to move down closer and closer to that 2% objective. And we've made you know, quite good progress on that over just the past year. So we want to continue those conditions. And I, I don't want to put the label on it. Other people can do that. But uh, I, I would just say we're using our tools to you know, keep a strong labor market and strong growth while you know, making further progress on getting inflation down to 2% for the benefit of the public. That's the economy that we, we're trying to achieve, and I, I think there's a, you know, we're on a good path so far to be able to get there. I'll just say that um, what we've seen so far is an economy that's growing at a solid pace. We, we're seeing a labor market that is still tight, still strong. Wages are moving up. Um, but the labor market's coming into better balance between supply and demand. And inflation has come down sharply, really, since the middle of last year. So those are the conditions we see. They're very attractive conditions, and we're trying to use our policies to keep that growth going and to keep that labor market strong while also achieving further progress on inflation. That's, that's our goal. And uh, I, do I think there's a possibility we can achieve all of that while keeping the labor market strong and the economy growing? Yes, I think there is a possibility. Indeed, that is what we're trying to achieve. Uh, from the most recent data available, food costs are up 21 percent since President Biden took office. Energy costs are up nearly 32 percent. Shelter costs are up more than 19 percent. And uh, you'll pay 37 percent more for a dozen eggs in America today. As you stated in January, people are still paying more for the basics of life, and the prices they're paying are still high. Families aren't happy about it, as you know. Um, so uh, what we said is that the committee would, uh, would like to see more data that confirm and make us more confident that inflation is moving sustainably down to 2%. We have some confidence of that. Inflation, uh, headline inflation has moved down more than three full percentage points now to 2.4%, as I mentioned in my remarks. We want to see a little bit more data so that we can become confident and so that we can take that step of beginning to reduce policy rates. It's a very important step. We think because of the strength in the economy and the strength in the labor market and the progress we've made, we can approach that step carefully and thoughtfully uh, and, and with greater confidence. And when we reach that confidence, the expectation if we will do so sometime this year, we can then begin dialing back the restriction on our policy. The Fed and the Biden administration have made to tackle inflation. We're not out of the woods yet. In fact, even though my Republican colleagues refuse to acknowledge this fact, housing is still the number one driver of inflation. Based on the latest data, housing costs continue to make up nearly 70% of overall price increases outpacing modest wage gains. This means that until we address the underlying housing supply shortage, Americans will continue to pay an increasing share 
of their income on housing. Long-term inflation expectations appear to have remained well anchored, as reflected by a broad range of surveys of households, businesses, and forecasters, as well as measures from financial markets. After significantly tightening the stance of monetary policy since early 2022, the FOMC has maintained the target range for the federal funds rate at 5.25% to 5.5% since its meeting last July. We've also continued to shrink our balance sheet at a brisk pace and in a predictable manner. A restrictive stance of monetary policy is putting downward pressure on economic activity and inflation. We believe that our policy rate is likely at its peak for this tightening cycle. If the economy evolves broadly as expected, it will likely be appropriate to begin dialing back policy restraint at some point this year. But the economic outlook is uncertain, and ongoing progress toward our 2% objective for inflation is not assured. Reducing policy restraint too soon or too much could result in a reversal of progress we've seen in inflation and ultimately require even tighter policy to get inflation back to 2%. At the same time, reducing policy restraint too late or too little could unduly weaken economic activity and employment. In considering any adjustments to the target range for the, for the policy rate, we will carefully assess the incoming data, the evolving outlook, and the balance of risks. The committee does not expect that it will be appropriate to reduce the target range until it has gained greater confidence that inflation is moving sustainably toward 2%. We remain committed to bringing inflation back down to our 2% goal and to keeping longer-run inflation expectations well anchored. Restoring price stability is essential to set the stage for achieving maximum employment and stable prices over the longer run. To conclude, we understand that our actions affect communities, families, and businesses across the country. Everything we do is in service to our public mission. We at the Federal Reserve will do everything we can to achieve our maximum employment and price stability goals. Going to a different economy, and we're going to be learning more about that uh, as we go, but clearly... We're, we're, we're learning that things can be done uh, from remote, remote locations. We're learning that technology can replace people even more than we thought. We're not going back to the same economy. We're, going, we're recovering, but to a different economy. And it'll be one that is more leveraged to technology. And I worry that that is going to make it even more difficult than it was for, for many workers. In Silicon Valley and my friends who work in technology know that what we did to the manufacturing workers, we are now going to do to the retail workers, the call center workers, the fast food workers, the truck drivers, and then even bookkeepers, accountants, uh, insurance agents, lawyers, and on and on through the economy. So what happened to the manufacturing workers is a very clear sign. And so we'll import Chinese-based CBDC technology. So it's going to be CBDC in a box. Uh, provided to you by the People's Bank of China. But every stock, every bond, every currency, every commodity, every piece of art, every private business, every piece of real estate will eventually be a token on a blockchain, an entry on a ledger, permanent and immutable. We will have truth instead of trust, and we will save over $7 trillion a year. Six to 8% of global GDP is wasted by the friction of the trust industry that's necessary when you have dual entry accounting. With triple entry accounting, which is what a blockchain is, mm -hmm. we get rid of all of that friction. It's a beautiful future. Like what you see in China and their social credit scoring systems, right? If we get identity wrong, you know, it could be a tool to enslave humanity. And if we get it right, it could be a tool to liberate humanity as an American, you know. Uh, uh, I'm obviously rooting for the, the one that's on the side of freedom. Bitcoin is an international asset. And also, I do believe the role of crypto is, um, it is, it, it is it's digitizing gold. I actually believe this technology is going to be very important. I am, I, you know, look at it. We have been part of a huge revolution in investing through ETFs. We believe that ETFs will be changing the whole way we invest. Many people still use it as a means, well, people are investing it f for indexing. No, the majority of people who are putting money in an index, in an ETFs are active investors that are buying exposure. The entire bond market is being transformed as we talk right now. I believe the next generation for markets, the next generation for securities will be, will be tokenization of securities. 
Um, we will, and if we can have that distributed ledger that we know every beneficial owner, every beneficial uh, seller, we all have our, our, our code right. of who's buying, who's selling, instantaneous settlement. And think about it, it changes the whole ecosystem. Chinese bank ICBC has been hit by a ransomware attack, and the U.S. Treasury market, as a result of that, um, has been disrupted. This, according to the Financial Times, we're, we're going to get more right now with Bloomberg's Shanali Basic. Shanali, what do we know? Uh, listen, we have the Financial Times now reporting that ICBC, one of China's largest banks here, was hit with a ransomware attack. And remember, they're a, a very significant intermediary in the Treasury market. The SIFMA has told as members that this has been part of the reason here uh, that the system is kind of clogged up, if you will, during that auction that we saw a little bit before. The attack had prevented ICBC, according to the Financial Times, from settling treasury trades on behalf of other market participants. A large executive at a major bank also telling the paper that such a large party on the fixed income clearing corp uh, creates major concerns, potentially impacting the liquidity of treasury markets. Now it was not just the poor auction. It was absolutely lousy, and, and uh, uh, you know, when, when the dealers have to step in to save a treasury auction, uh, that's a rare occurrence. And Crypto teacher and the new world order book, plus the three kids' books, it's time to re-educate. Also, new to cryptos, Coinbase, Bitchu, Binance. Do not forget book links and crypto links are in the description. The stock channel, guys. Don't forget to go like, subscribe, spread everywhere. You have your Kobo, your chip size, your banking, your gaming, while everybody's sitting at home, get on stocks, the receiver, the biotech stocks, and while everybody's at home wishing, they were still getting that free money. What are they doing? Drinking and smoking weed. Don't forget about those stocks, and you have a wonderful day. most powerful person in the world is the storyteller. The storyteller sets the vision, values, and agenda of an entire generation to come. Steve Jobs. And guys, you know I truly believe in this. When you look at the New World Order, they're the storytellers. And that's the reason why I wrote my New World Order book. But guys, now it's time to change the current generation. And I wrote three kids' books. You know, I love the Trinity because I understand the power that's in it. So I have three books. We have an opportunity to change the generation, to educate, not just me, but I want to show you that I take action on a daily basis. And I want you to take action on a daily basis, whether it's your job, whether it's in your community. We have an opportunity right now to educate the masses. I posted this on my Twitter account. Please share. But this is a short clip of the three books. There's going to be a clothing line and action figure. Please get these books for your kids, nephews, cousins, friends. So therefore, we can start the re-education now. Because as we see, the fourth industrial revolution foundation is definitely here. Robots, algorithms, drones, taking humanity out the picture. We have to re-educate. But let's get into the video. Part 1. King Joshua and Grandma Tim save the village. Part 2. King Joshua and Grandma Tim save New York. Long COVID-33. Part 3. King Joshua and Grandma Tim goes to China. It's mandatory to get Part 1, Part 2, and Part 3 of this series. It's time to re-educate Generation Z.